Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. Dance hall, just like its offshoot, hip hop, has been a hyper competitive field and it's always been a big task identifying a king at any particular point in time. But Shabaranks is one notable exception to this phenomenon. At the peak of his career in the early 1990s, he was second to none and was the most iconic, charismatic, and dominant dancehall star. If we delve even deeper, Shaba was at the time one of the most popular and most in-demand artists on the planet. It's been held by many commentators that he single-handedly dragged dancehall into the global mainstream, doing duets with diverse artists from diverse genres of music. At his hottest, it wasn't unusual for people in the streets to compare his popularity to that of Michael Jackson. And such comparisons only became more widespread when Shaba, against all odds, became the first dancehall artist to win the Grammy Award for Best Reggae Album. But what's more amazing is that he won the award back to back. In that era, Shabaranks was the undisputed king of dancehall with an unbelievable story arc that saw him rise from Kingston Rude Boy to one of the most famous men on the globe. His story began as Rexton Fernando Gordon on the 17th of January 1966 in Sturge Town, St. Anne, Jamaica. At the age of eight, his family moved to Kingston and settled in the tough Seaview Gardens ghetto. Growing up in that environment, he began to run with the rude boys around him and in his own words, became a troublemaker. He was heading for a life of crime when as a teenager, he had a once in a lifetime experience that totally changed the trajectory of his life. One weekend, his brother-in-law invited him to come along and make some money collecting used bottles at an event where dancehall superstar Josie Wales was performing. As the story goes, Shaba was totally captivated by the performance and abandoned his job of picking bottles, much to his brother-in-law's frustration. The experience did have a positive side as young Rexton had made up his mind about what he wanted to do with his life. He threw himself into music and began to practice regularly to perfect his craft. By the age of 16, he had been expelled from school and had developed an ever-growing reputation as a rude boy, but he was also known in the streets for his toasting talents. He had been noticed by another upcoming DJ named Desmond Ballantyne, aka Ninja Man, who introduced him to the now legendary Kilimanjaro sound system. He began to freelance under Admiral Bailey at a sound system called The Roots Melody and was paired with a selector called The Navigator and this prompted him to acquire the stage name of Co-Pilot, where he began to sharpen his skills even more. If Josie Wales inspiring him at that first event had been a coincidence, a second encounter would prove that Josie Wales had a divine role to play in young Rexton's life. Josie Wales had seen him mashing it up at a Kilimanjaro event and later saw him in the streets hanging out with his rude boyfriends one day. He pulled the teenager aside and offered him some advice to leave the streets and the dangerous life that he was living. Josie Wales invited him to come with him the next day to a studio where he was going to record. That studio turned out to be King Jami Studio, one of the biggest in Jamaica and the birthplace of Digital Dance Hall. Wales took young Rexton to King Jami and after vouching for his skills, Jami offered him a job as a DJ. He would change his name to Shaba Ranks and released lots of material and eventually began to release his own albums. And those albums were produced by King Jami's chief studio engineer and producer, Bobby Digital. And the duo's chemistry had resulted in breakout success for Shaba. And one of his albums, titled Rapping with the Ladies, had hit songs like Twice My Age and Mr. Loverman, which Shaba would re-release later with devastating results. He was also making singles on the side with other artists that were gaining major traction and spreading his popularity as a DJ, especially one that specialized in love songs. It was at this stage that his relationship with his erstwhile friend and benefactor, Ninja Man, began to deteriorate. It is not expressly clear of the true cause of the rifts between both men, but Shaba hinted recently in an interview that even though he started out as a rude boy, he chose to move his music from that spectrum to a lighter subject matter, a decision that didn't go down too well with Ninja Man. In Shaba's own words, I chose to be a DJ for the girls and Ninja Man a DJ for the gunman. This rift would later degenerate into a drawn-out beef that came into the public eye during the 1990 edition of the Sting Reggae Concert. Both heavyweights went head-to-head -head in a lyrical battle that Ninja Man ultimately won, and a heated rivalry continued to brew. 
Soon after, Shabbat's exploding popularity created an opening for him in the international market when he signed with Epic Records in 1991 and released the album As Raw As Ever in the same year. The album was also produced by Bobby Digital and was a huge critical and commercial success, spawning two major hits in the hard-thumping Trailer Loader Girls and the smash single House Call that featured British reggae artist Maxi Priest. It won Shaba his first Grammy in 1992 for Best Reggae Album, the first ever by a dancehall artist. He re-released the song titled Mr. Lover Man as a single the same year and it became a monster hit that was among the biggest songs in the world for more than a year. He followed up his Grammy achievements when his next album Extra Naked also backed the Grammy in 1993, taking the award home back to back. The biggest singles on Extra Naked were Ting A Ling, a diss track that most people believe was aimed at Ninja Man, as well as Slow and Sexy featuring American R&B star Johnny Gill. While the world was already used to dancehall stars like Yellow Man and Supercat, Shaba was unlike anything that anybody had ever seen before. His Gunby haircuts, sunglasses, heavy jewelry, clothes and general swagger made him look more like a hip-hop artist and made him very acceptable in the US where his influence was heavily felt. Another defining legacy of Shaba's career was the way he paved the way for future dancehall stars to collaborate with A-list artists from other genres of music. His first international collaboration was with the UK pop band Scritti Politi and was followed by House Call with Maxi Priest, I Was a King with Eddie Murphy, What You're Gonna Do with Queen Latifah, not to mention The Jam with KRS-One, among others. In 1994, he scored another hit with the song Family Affair, a cover of the Sly and Family Stone song that was recorded as part of the soundtrack for the movie Adam's Family Values. In 1995, he released a third album for Epic Records, titled Ami Shaba. The album retained his usual producer, Bobby Digital, and even featured the brilliant instrumentals of Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare. But it failed to match the super successes of his two previous albums. He released a few more albums over the years, with each one great in its own right, but lacking the commercial success of previous works. It's been widely held that the decline in his sales was as a result of him being cancelled by the industry due to a statement he made in an interview in 1992, but I personally doubt it. My personal opinion is that it peaked the same time that Dancehall peaked, and eventually Dancehall began to give way to the resurgence of Roots Reggae by the end of the 1990s. Shaba largely withdrew from the limelight and focused on raising his children with his wife, Michelle Gordon. But make no mistake, he's still very active on the touring circuits and releases material every now and then. But he's not very keen on diving back completely into the music industry. His main passion these days is activism for the sanitization of the music industry in Jamaica. He received the Order of Distinction in 2016 for his contributions to Jamaican music. His cultural impact in dance hall can't be overstated as he's been a major influence on artists that have come after him. He's something of a modern-day prototype with his rich baritone, striking looks and effortless charisma. And though he can be labelled the greatest ever in his genre, it wouldn't be too far from the truth to describe Shabarangs as the king of modern dancehall. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, Jobless.